So I've been wanting to do a series on Gaming Reinvented where I talk about each Final Fantasy game as I play them for a while. But I decided to start with Final Fantasy IV because I need more time to write about my experience with Final Fantasy VI. Then with Final Fantasy XIV, I want to follow a different structure with that one since there's expansions rather than just one standalone game. So Final Fantasy IV it is. These videos will also feature spoilers for the game. I'm not going to be beating around the bush with these, since I want to be as honest as possible, so this is your warning for this particular video. Lastly, I played through it blind and on the DS version of the game, which is important to mention here as it changes my perspective more than if I had played one of the other 10 versions of the game out there. I wish I was exaggerating, this game released on so many different platforms, a lot of which are vastly different. So with all that out of the way, let's get straight into it. Let's start with the plot, which is a mix of the stereotypical classic Final Fantasy formula and Square Enix's attempt to give the characters personalities. The DS version of the game gives us a cool looking opening, along with a few cutscenes to get us more into the story. They even had voice acting, which is really impressive for a DS game. The game stars Cecil Harvey, a dark knight who's the captain of the Red Wings, or at least he was the captain of the Red Wings until he literally got fired by the king five minutes into the game. But he sends both Cecil and his best friend Cain on a quest to kill a dragon and bring a ring to a village. Well, it turns out that the dragon they killed was actually the mom of a powerful summoner called Rydia, and the ring set the village on fire and released monsters from it. This causes Cecil to start thinking for himself rather than just his loyalty towards others, change his career from an unemployed Dark Knight to a still unemployed but slightly more respected paladin, and he goes off to save the world. From this point forward, we collect crystals based on the elements, only to have them taken away from us for one reason or another. We also met various other party members throughout the story. The story itself was basic, but it's alright. It's definitely a Final Fantasy game plot, that's for sure. That in itself was fine and to be expected. The real issue with the plot comes from the characters that join and leave the party. There's 12 playable party members, including Cecil you end up playing with. So you've got the main five. Cain, who got possessed multiple times and left the party more times than that. Rosa, your typical love interest, who's either used as a plot device or the typical white mage. Rydia, who's in the party for a bit, falls off a boat, then returns in the last quarter of the game as a full-grown woman for some weird reason. They do explain why, but it's still weird. Then we've got Edge, a ninja who appears late in the party, only to flirt with Rydia and Rosa, even though Rydia is a child but not a child. It's kinda icky either way. And finally, there's Cecil, of course, who's the only consistent playable character in the whole game and one of the few who got a fleshed out story. For other party members, you've got Tella, who actually was quite fleshed out and the various times he left and rejoined the party kind of made sense for his character, but he sacrificed himself for the greater good. After that, you've got Yang, who was powerful and kinda cool, but he sacrificed himself for the greater good, even though the party had two powerful mages that could do long-ranged spells. Then you've got Porum and Palon, two twin mages you only get in the party for about three hours before they sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Then you've also got Sid, who made the airships with the Red Wings, but he sacrificed himself for the greater good. Yeah, you can see why the plot of the game started to really bug me. When Final Fantasy IV was done with a character, the game literally killed them off. Except Psyche? Everyone except Tella is actually alive. So all those deaths were a waste of time and felt like they were for nothing because they all just kind of came back anyway. Like I mentioned before, Cecil's character is quite interesting. He's a self-made hero who has to work for it. He made awful mistakes and has to live with them, but doesn't forget about them for the sake of coming off as a perfect person. Sure, the end of the game proved that it was his destiny after all due to his family connections, but he wasn't born with that silver spoon in his mouth and still had to put in the work to find all that out on his own. Oh yeah, Edward and Fashoa are also there, but Edward sucks and Fashoa was in the party even less than the twins were. So I said earlier that most of the party members didn't stay long enough for me to get attached. Well, here's a quick rundown of how much everyone joins and leaves the party. Keep in mind that this is all within maybe 35 hours of gameplay. Okay. First off, Cecil is playable from the get-go, followed by Kane joining the party. An earthquake happens, causing Kane to leave the party, but we end up getting Rydia instead. Cecil and Rydia meet Tella, who joins the party while finding a cure for Rosa's illness. Edward joins, but Tella leaves to seek revenge on his own. Not a great trade-off if you ask me, and this is coming from someone who has a soft spot for bards. Rosa is cured and joins the party. 
followed quickly by Yang. This brings the party to five members for the first time so far. Rosa is kidnapped, leaving the party back to four members. That doesn't last long before everyone gets in a shipwreck and Cecil is on his own again. Horam and Palon join the party and eventually Tella joins too, bringing the party back to four but with an almost completely different cast of characters. Yang then rejoins the party, bringing the party back to five for the second time. This is short-lived though, when Poron and Palon sacrifice themselves, dropping the party to three until Sid shows up and brings it back to four. The party is actually consistent for a while until Tella sacrifices himself, but at least now we got Kian and Rose back. Sid leaves the party for a bit to fix the airship, but Rydia randomly appears again, this time as an adult. At this point I've lost track of how many party members we have all together, but can you blame me? Yang then sacrifices himself, followed almost quickly by Sid. Edge then joins the party, since he's going that direction anyway. Kian was under mind control throughout most of the game and leaves the party again because he's again under mind control. Freshoya joins the party for a little bit until Kian comes to his senses once again. This means that the permanent party is now Cecil, Kian, Rosa, Rydia, and Edge. Oh guys, I think I'm out of breath. Now I know that RPGs tend to have shuffling party members. The Tales series is known for doing this and Mother 3 is also big on doing it until halfway through the game where they establish the main party. But the fact that I had to write this entire rundown in bullet points and with the plot open on Wikipedia as I wrote it says a lot. There are right and wrong ways to shuffle the party and Final Fantasy IV definitely did it wrong. On a more positive note, the gameplay is mostly pretty good. I like RPGs where each party member has an obvious role to play. It gives me less to figure out in the heat of battle, especially since they're active timed battles. I know just from playing that Riddy is my powerful summoner, Edge is my hard hitting ninja and Rosa is my amazing white mage. When prey actually works. Seriously Rosa, I need MP. There were a few difficulty spikes when it came to the battles though, especially in the boss fights. Unless you're extremely overpowered, the only way to defeat a lot of these is if you know as much as possible about the enemies in question. Then with the boss fights, you actually need to know the exact strategy to defeat them most of the time. Cagnazzo in particular is really annoying. I knew how to defeat him and knew his weaknesses, but it felt like he could do every brutal thing under the sun in order to make the battle really frustrating. The battle difficulty spikes were the main reason I stopped playing in the final dungeon. There were just so many bosses and it got really frustrating. Hell, there was one point in the game where I went to fight a boss that had three segments. One of my party members said to take out one part of the boss first when the solution was to take out a different part instead. That party member would have been right in any other version of the game, but in the DS version it's literally misinformation that got me killed multiple times until I opened up a guide. It's one thing to have a typo in a game, but false information really isn't on and Square Enix should have picked up on that. Traversing the overworld is good though. Going on foot isn't too bad, riding in airships is fun, and the DS version even has a map on the bottom screen. It even shows the map of whatever cave, castle, or town you're in and shows any chests in the area on screen. It's not just limited to the world map. The only thing I find annoying about exploring the world were those rooms or areas that were hidden in the black voids around other rooms. I never knew that was a thing that could happen until I started looking at guides for the game. But it's apparently a thing in other classic Final Fantasy games and there was probably an NPC that tells the player about this, so this is just a nitpick and it could be on me. One thing I have very few complaints on though was the music. I'd even say that Final Fantasy IV has some of the most iconic songs in the entire series. And they sound really good in the DS version as well. First you've got the Battle 2 theme which is just epic. It's one of those battle themes that not only gets me into the battle, but I find myself turning the volume up and dancing a little bit as I'm fighting. I'm excited to hopefully hear this one again in the Super Mario RPG remake. Then you got Tro and Beauty, which is my favourite castle theme in the game.
It has a different vibe to the other, more soldier type ones. It has more of an elegant feeling to it, which I guess makes sense since this kingdom is ruled by eight women instead of one king or one prince like everywhere else. Still, it's a really pretty song. Lastly, we've got Anxiety the Song, also known as Battle with the Four Fiends. To me personally though, it's the Cognazo Can Burn in Hell song. I played the songs earlier in the video, so I won't waste more time sharing them here, but honourable mention goes out to the love theme simply for being iconic, and the town theme for being a really nice song. Plus, I have a soft spot for town themes. Overall, I think I was too strict on the game when I initially stopped playing. I was optimistic when it mattered, but I'll admit that my judgement was clouded by things that annoyed me like the plot and difficulty spikes. Writing the script for this video made me appreciate the good things in the game more even if I also did highlight the bad. I still have no intention of finishing it, but I played almost the entire main story, so I'm satisfied and felt confident enough to make a video about it here. And with that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to subscribe to Gaming Reinvented. And if you have any thoughts or opinions on Final Fantasy IV, please feel free to leave a comment below or join the Discord server. Until next time, bye!